We have a, uh, another terrific conversation uh, this afternoon with Jeff, uh, this morning still, with Jeff Bukas, uh, who, as you all know, uh, runs Time Warner. He's had, uh, again, a, a kind of quiet year. Yeah. Not, not, so, not so quiet. Um, and uh, successfully, I don't know if, you, if fending off is the right word, uh, Rupert Murdoch, but we should note that the stock is now actually up at the price of that offer uh, originally. Yeah. Uh, of uh, close to $85 now, so. No surprise to everyone here, I think. Of, of, of course. Um, you have uh, announced a new plan, uh, a new growth plan for the company, which mm -hmm. I think is in part why the stock may be where it, where, where it is today. And, but that plan came after the bid. And I, and I just want to understand the thinking in terms of how, how you think you got to that, to, what was the inflection point to pursue the growth plan that you've now gone on? Okay, we made the plan before that. So that's the part I have to, I guess, uh, refine or correct because we don't always tell everybody what we're in the midst of doing. So our plans at Time Warner, I, if I, uh, well, let me answer the thing quickly and then tell you how I think about it. Um, we were in the, process over a period of years of focusing the company on the video worldwide content explosion that's happening. So whether it was separating our cable system, putting AOL independent, or most recently in June, taking our magazine company and having it be independent. And I think it's now, I think it's the world's largest magazine publishing company on its own. Um, why did we do that? And those things were all years in the planning. Because if you look around the world, the biggest secular boom in the world is basically television viewing. And it's true on TVs, but you can't think of it as just TV viewing on, TV, on te televisions. It's television viewing on electronic screens, whether it's internet delivered or whether it's part of your cable subscription or you're on an iPod or an iPad. So we tried to get our company over a period of years into that position. And what was happening in the, uh, really a year ago, so well before all of this, we had new management at HBO, Turner and Warners. We were well underway of doing a restructuring and streamlining of the company, which you just really all saw about a month ago. But these things take time. And we had the magazine spend that was finishing in June. We hadn't told uh, the world as much as we now have said publicly about our growth plans. But it's really worth pointing out that um, forget these, inc these incidents of this last year. We've been growing Time Warner earnings at 25% a year for six years. So we had this huge growth cycle going. I think what led to these events of the spring was that we were, despite that historic growth rate, we were undervalued. We had a multiple on Time Warner uh, earnings, which was about 16 or 17. And Disney and Fox were up closer to 20, which I think if you're in the shoes of those other companies, you think, well, this might be a good time to see if we can use this differential to do some things I think uh, it would be obvious that everybody would want to own the, the growth of Time Warner. They just didn't know that it would continue in such a robust way. So when we made that decision because we knew where we were going and we obviously didn't want to have it interrupted or in any way uh, put to risk by a long process. You know, there's a lot goes on if you try to take companies and put them together. One of the things that goes on is a, a pretty extended regulatory review and then if you really want to do something like that, there's a lot that happens when you take giant things and put them together where it could either come out well or not so well. So since we had robust plans, that's what we were thinking. We told everybody, look, you've seen what we've done over the last five, six years. Just wait till the fall. We'll tell you a little more details of what we're doing. And when we came out and about a month ago explained that we're going to be $4 a year this year of earnings will be at six bucks in two years, roughly. And we'll be over $8, which is doubling the earnings of the company in, in uh, roughly four years. 
that makes pretty clear that you don't want to interrupt that with uh, these other kinds right. of things. Personal question, how much personal pressure do you now feel having had to actually put those expectations out there? So, you know, it's one thing to under promise and over deliver. Yeah, which, another... is, which is really the best thing and I wish we could go back to that. <laughs> but no, but, and that's, but that, that is, I'm, I'm curious, this is a, a yeah. manager. No, well look, our plans were there. So uh, it's no secret because we've been consistent about our capital allocation also. We've been buying in our stock at a reasonably regular rate. Uh, what we do is basically make very steady cash flow. We've had very strong earnings growth. I think we're the highest growing media company and have been. And so when we come up every year with, you know, three, four billion dollars of cash that we generate, when our earnings go up, it creates more capacity because we try to keep our debt leverage around two and three quarters times earnings. So that means basically we're increasing our cash that we need to put to work by somewhere in the neighborhood of $5 billion a year. Now we've been, and obviously you have to announce this, and we've been on a pretty steady path. We're happy to look at things, acquisitions. Right. That $5 billion is after we invest in more content slates at HBO, Warner, and Turner that you know, I think we've had a higher growth of investment in our programming than anybody else also. So you know, it ends up going into, if there's no good opportunity, uh, the best growing media earnings that we could buy. We can either buy somebody else's, we can buy ours. We've been buying ours. And therefore, when I have to answer your question, well, how do we feel when we've got a well-established buyback of telling everybody how great this is, my temptation when I come to things like this is to do kind of a mediocre job. So if you find, <laughs> if you find me being dull, that I'm trying to be dull. Um, well, let me, let me try to uh, raise the stakes then and make, uh, ask you a provocative question. At the time uh, that that bid was overhanging the company, uh, there was a view that culturally those companies could not fit. That was a view in, at least inside Time Warner. Um, no, there, we didn't quite say that. I don't think you ever said that publicly. No, we like those guys. Not that much. Well, we, but, we, we, we like um, them. Are there cute. other companies that you think that you're more culturally aligned with? I'm tempted to say Exxon. <laughs> um, <laughs> let me try a different topic. Uh, HBO. HBO, yeah. one of the... the no, I don't, you know, I don't, I, I don't mean to be flippant about it. I'm just saying, you know, you all know, I, some, most of you, the, the history of Time Warner. We did some pretty big mergers. So we do know from firsthand experience, and I myself was there for all of them. Not saying you can't do it, but if you take one set of cultures and methods of making decisions, and we're pretty proud of our fiercely competitive, fiercely debate society method of innovating at Time Warner. Uh, and you put it with another one. Um, you know, I, this, it's not, you just got to make sure when you do that that you're going to have an effective company. If you're talking about, in that case, it was a couple of hundred billion dollar companies. That's a big scope of management to deal with. And uh, it ought to be thought of very seriously when you, when you approach something like that. You think that ever returns, by the way? What? Mr. Murdoch? You know, I don't want to speak for them um, out of respect for their whatever they like to do in life. I doubt, given these events, and it's really what I'm saying now, that anybody ought to approach such a large undertaking as that without real determined intent and cooperative work on both sides. Because in order to do it successfully, it has to be something that basically is pretty obviously a good thing to do that people throughout all the different organizations involved would know is a good thing to do and they would want to do it effectively. So I think that's the answer. And this one they did not. Let me ask you, I do want to talk to you about HBO and I want to talk to you about over the top and, mm -hmm. and where all of the media is moving. Uh, but let me start with HBO. One of the, one of the announcements is that HBO, uh, HBO to go is now going to be available to the cord, you call them cord nevers, yeah. um, folks who uh, don't have, uh, cable as we mm -hmm. know it, but they have an internet cord. 
How do you think that doing, how do you think this is gonna change your relationship, or, or will it, yeah. with the cable operators? Well, we hope it improves it. And I don't mean to say that, you know, being full of it up here on, on, on stage. Um, why do I say that? Because let's just go to the facts before we do those things. There's, there are 110 million homes, TV homes in America. About 100 million of them have multi-channel TV. They've signed up for 100 plus channels. Cable, satellite, telco delivered. Stop right there. That is one of the most successful high ticket items in modern life. It is a tremendous success. And that's in the United States. If you look all over the world, you see the same exact thing. You see this explosion of people all over the world wanting hundreds of channels of television. Now, depending when you put in the electronic system to do it, the technology that you, that's used varies from place to place. But that's what people want. And so go back to the, the US. There's 100 million video homes in America. 30 of the 100 have HBO and Showtime stars and all of that. 70 million of the 100 don't. And if you look at that 70 million, these are cable, telco, you know, TV subs. They love, you know, whether it's CNN, Fox News, TNT, USA, FX, think of all the shows you all may watch. And 70 million just have that. They don't have HBO or you know, stars or any of those things. Um, they love the product. But in that 70 million, um, there are a number of homes, probably 15 million, who are exactly the same as the 30 million that have HBO. They have the same kind of habits. They have the same economic situation. But they haven't been offered a premium subscription, no advertising service, whether it's HBO, right. Showtime, or Stars. Effectively, it's either been priced wrong, they didn't get offered. Some of our distributors have penetration that's twice as high as others. So we think the real opportunity by doing this and is not to get them by over the top, but to stimulate much more aggressive marketing for the, by the cable and telco industry. So we're going to help with the that. package. Yeah, definitely. And then. The ten, everybody always goes to the broadband. I don't know why it's, it gets a little disproportionate attention. There are 10 million broadband only subs. There were 5 million three years ago. And half of those are subscribers to Amazon, Netflix, Hulu Plus, something like that. And it's very clear that probably half of them want HBO, but they have no way to get it. So we thought, all right, let's find a way to get that to them, probably the, uh, the best placed distributors to do that are the existing cable right. and telco guys, because they're selling broadband to these homes. So we've also said we might have some new distributors to help us, companies that are great at global internet-based marketing and servicing and things like that. I leave that yeah, as What a, is that hint? What is, well, what that hint basically is we want to use those companies that are capable of helping deliver a good product with good interfaces to customers. The Apples of the world. Well, it would be Apples, Amazon. You know, there's a long list of companies that are in that kind of area. I'm not saying right. whether we'll do that or which ones. I'm just saying we shouldn't close off that option. And then the final option, which is you shouldn't close off, is that we could do it ourselves. That's basically what Netflix does. Um, if you're going to do that, you end up with all the money at retail coming to you, but you end up with costs and activities, capabilities you have to develop that are not trivial capabilities. Well, uh, the question on pricing, though. Yeah. So right now, all in, it's about 15 bucks. It, it, that, that's, that's what the price is for the An folks. HBO? HBO. Yeah, well, let, you go ahead, and then Back I'll tell jokes after that. <laughs> wait, wait, tell, think, just. Can I tell the joke now? Please. So you might be sitting there thinking, yeah, 15 bucks. That, that's, no, when I tried to get HBO, they told me I had to buy lawn service. I need five more converter boxes. There's uh, you know, seven other charges I gotta have. And, I, and you know, at Christmas, I need to buy turkey from Walmart or something like that. I mean, that's what goes on sometimes when you're trying to buy HBO. So it's not that easy. Which is why, in, you know, in, in uh, affiliate areas where people are selling it like that for 15 bucks, it has high penetration. When it's being loaded up, 
with everything else, then uh, you know it's essentially right. being used as a as a workhorse. But I, I guess where I was going with that though is, is mm -hmm. the argument that from a price point, if you think that Netflix is your competitor in this market, maybe you think of yourself. Well, that's in a one of them. Completely different space, but someone who's excelled in this over-the-top space. Yeah. Oh, you mean the, in the over-the-top, the, if they're selling right, for it, eight yeah. or nine? If they're selling for eight or nine, yeah. you're going to have to sell for materially more. And my question, therefore, becomes how big is the growth opportunity, given that I think recently when, when Netflix uh, announced uh, their earnings and they had just raised the price by a buck, it, act, it slowed down their sales more than they expected. Yeah. And, that, and that, even that one dollar was relevant. Well, I suspect there's one person rooting really hard for our success in both volume and higher price would be Reed Hastings, because it, it would help them. But anyway, why? Of course, because look at what HBO has. It has more, half or more of all current movies, that, and you can't get them anywhere else when they're in the HBO window. They're free on demand on any device you want. Nobody else has that, not Netflix, not Showtime, nobody. Right. Um, you have the biggest slate of groundbreaking original programming by far at, at like 10 times the level anybody else has. So that's why it has quite a value at the kind so, of price. So look how far, Although though. I didn't confirm your price because we haven't set that. Thank you. Um, look at a little bit further just in, in terms of television land and over the top. Do you expect, so, so you guys are going over the top with, with HBO, uh, Les Moonves? We prefer to call it broadband delivered to the extent possible with partnership of those companies that provide you the broadband. Because everybody's forgetting, you do want for the broadband plant to continue to get right. more capacity and somebody's gotta pay for that. Okay, let me put it then in the context of a la carte. Yes. Okay, we may, are, we, are we moving to an a la carte world? Les Moonves? No. We are not no. moving to an a la carte world. Not it is not so going much. to be that I'm going to buy CBS uh, over here. I'm going to buy HBO over here. I'm going to buy Netflix over here. I'll buy the package of NBC Family uh, over here. I don't know. If, I don't know if you'd sell all the NBC pieces together, given that they have uh, different things. You guys have your own things. Yeah. That's not how this is going to happen. I doubt it. I mean, by like, five may, years it may now. get offered that way, but the bundle will be better and cheaper in terms of the value. I think. So uh, the thing that's putting the most pressure on the bundle price is the sports, because you know half the people are a little less watch those, and the other half are paying for the ones that are. But generationally, you don't think that we're going to move into to, to, a, to a place uh, where yeah. those those ten million uh, by one after you know one thing or the other. Well, maybe, but you know it won't be that big that fast. And the question I think we all have to ask is, if you're if you're designing products here for the 21st century internet age of, uh, to hopefully discriminating viewers. Right. You, you, you're asking, would you design the product offering based on what some company happens to own? Which doesn't make a lot of sense if you stop and think about it. It, it, it should be designed in terms of the grouping of what people want in natural either affinity groups or something maybe genres that, that somebody wants. So if you then go to the practicality that a lot of these channels that got created, particularly by the broadcast companies, NBC, CBS, Fox, ABC, were kind of cable channels that they launched to get carriage fees when they couldn't get a fee for the broadcast network because they hadn't yet moved to that model. And they were trying to do that. They have channels that exist next right. to broadcast that are not natural companions if you try to sell them to a 20-year-old person. So it raises the question. What do you think of the future of carriage fees broadly? I mean, cable what? has lived and died by the carriage fee in large part. Lived and mostly. Lived mostly. <laughs> yeah. And the question, the question is, is it going to die mostly? No, in I don't an, think so. If we, tra if we transition to a place where people are buying things a la carte and that carriage fee won't exist or, or will no, exist well, in a different way. It has to exist in some fashion. If you think about what's happened at TV in the last 40 years, well, let's just go back to what happened. We had free television all over the developed world, US, Europe, et cetera. And there were three or four channels that were, you know, maybe five. They were, they were ad supported, which meant that all of the economics drove to mass low common denominator programming to gather the audience for the advertisers because the customer was Procter & Gamble, not the viewer. 
So what happened in the 70s and 80s is quote unquote cable channels, HBO, CNN, got developed that essentially said, we're gonna give you the choice, the freedom really, to pay for what you want. You, you get the freedom to pay for it. So free is not the ultimate thing. You, can not, you don't have to pay for it, but you can. So what happened? Revolution everywhere. Hey, I'd like to pay for my TV. HBO is the ultimate example of that. We don't have advertising. So we don't really care whether it's more viewers or less for girls versus Game of Thrones. We don't get money from that. Uh, it, it, it created a lot of choice, and it led to subscription being the thing that was such a useful thing right. because it allowed the programming to depart from purely volume eyeballs as the way that you choose what the programming is. If you take the next revolution, because that, that's the carriage piece, basically. Then, when we put VOD into the mix at HBO 10, 15 years ago, what that then did is it made it possible to do new original shows that don't stop and end at every episode. We could do Sopranos for 90 episodes. We could do a story over a long period of time. You can't do that with ad-supported TV in the old days, at least not high-budget things, because you, you, if you can't kind of rerun it regardless of whether you saw the one before, you can't have it. So that's changed everything, and that's what's changed syndication in the last five years, because now that you have not just HBO, but Netflix, where you can watch a show in order, even though you didn't start right. until late, that means you now have an aftermarket for Breaking Bad or Game of Thrones, you know, or all the shows that, that are but made But it's very way. interesting because the aftermarket has become Netflix and things like that. The aftermarket yeah. is no longer the old syndication market, which is also a very... Um, well, it could be TNT and TBS, because if well, you think the, about... But, okay, but that's where I'm going with it. Are there thin... Given the landscape, a channel like a TNT, which has repeat programs. Which for, otherwise known as hits. Hits. Yeah. Um, and there are other, how, ch there are other, are. There are other channels <laughs> that syndicate lots of content uh, that, yeah. that are effectively repeats. Do those channels work yes. in an environment where everybody's going to be going VOD with Netflix or HBO to go or what have you? Yes. Let's take some examples. Uh, Big Bang Theory on TBS, rerun, right? Big Bang Theory, biggest show in America, biggest half hour show on CBS, new episode every week, tune in this week, and older episode, reruns of this proven hit on TBS. The number one show on broadcast is new episodes of Big Bang. The number one show on the cable dial is reruns, hits on TBS. And when you go to that and you say, is it a value to the viewer on TBS? Two thirds of them never saw the first time it was on. So it's not a what you, repeat, it's a hit. What do you see about those viewers though? In terms of the demo of that viewer, is that a different, do you, does that viewer have access to do? To those do? are good people, let's face it. <laughs> let's talk about how great I, those people are. I understand how this works and why it works now. And that's just the, you're now talking about the acquired hits on TBS, TNT, USA, FX, which are very important. Now granted, you can't put a mediocre one on as well as you used to because people have a choice. I think that's where you're going. But what that does is it serves as a fantastic launching path. Proven hits, great audience right. dynamic for original programming. So if you say, Hey, original programming is the new thing. Well, not to us. We, we started it. Um, well, how do you tell people, if everybody's going to make original programming, how the hell are you going to know which original programming you like and how do you right. get introduced to it? That's what the powerful combination of hit programming, quote, rerun proven programming, and new breakthrough originals if you offer them correctly. In the older days, it was obviously a very schedule-dependent right. thing. We all know this. You know, you had the hit on at 8, you have the new thing on at 9. You can still do that to, a good, to get it started. But now it's VOD. So you t take the last ship, big hit show from Turner, TNT. I got to say, TNT has, I think, most of the hit shows on cable or on TNT. Um, trying to remember exactly the number. It's like six of them or very high. 
And the last ship, which went on this year in the summer, it's an original show on, on TNT. Two to three, you know, if you take the original airing on the schedule of the last ship, it was pretty good. Right. The cum viewing of that show in uh, BOD is two and a half times the start. So we are moving to a VOD world, but to have the power of all those channels where you know to go find your favorite show, maybe it's Breaking right. Bad on uh, a basic network, and watch it on VOD, the, the, key, the key is, where can I get the show I want on VOD? Now, if it's on right. Netflix, you watch it on Netflix. If it's on TNT, you're watching you it on TNT. When you think about the economics of these programs, I'm thinking Netflix now launching this new Marco Polo program. Uh, yeah, it uh, sounds great. $90 million. Yeah. This is uh, second only to the cost of Game of Thrones. Impressive. Impressive. That they could pull up a thing like that. The cost of that show, or the cost of Game of Thrones, the yeah. economics of, the game, of game of Thrones. Fantastic. But it works when there's a market to put that show af in a, in a post-HBO life. Right, which happens to be on HBO. The, and, but that's the, post, where, the post HBO and that's life where, of Game of Thrones, in case you're trying to find it, is HBO. But at the, I mean, that becomes the question. Little You've hands. always been able to monetize yeah. those programs in a, in a sort of afterlife on yeah. other places. Right. If you hold on to them the entire time, yeah. are you able to create the same type of economics yeah. for a hit show? Well, I guess you're asking whether Netflix is going to license Marco Polo to somebody else. Yes. Yeah. Well, nobody else has as much SVOD base to pay for it as they do. Although, actually, if they went around the world and tried to give it to Sky and Britain, Germany, Italy, and Orange right. and France, maybe they could do better. We'll see if they do it. Um, generally, what it says is that the aftermarket for serialized shows, that's a serialized thing, has to be VOD. That's all it says. It doesn't matter which VOD, um, it, but it has to be VOD. Right. If it's a you know, situation comedy, it's a procedural meaning a drama, think of Law and Order where you can watch a new one, who knows which one it was. That can be on traditional syndication. It doesn't have right. to be VOD. Um, let me, let me uh, turn our attention to a very different topic, uh, which is uh, mergers and the, the regulations uh, world that we're living in today. There are two major media mergers in terms of the pipes that are taking place right now. You have AT&T and DirecTV. You have Comcast uh, merging with Time Warner Cable. I should note Comcast is the parent company of uh, NBC and CNBC, where I spend my mornings. Um, your, Do we wave, uh, wave at them? Should we wave at them? Um, they are watching us now. Your sense... Um, of those deals, mm -hmm. good for competition, bad for competition? You're, you're the content creator here. Is this well, bad for you? There have been the, people who the, think this might be. So your question is, <laughs> if I, I, wanna, I don't want to answer that question, but at least not here. I'd rather talk to other review, the, the, the regulators about it. But, so the question I think we have to ask ourselves is whether having the biggest cable company and the biggest broadband deliverer, even bigger, merge with the second biggest cable company and have a uh, you know, fairly dominant position in a number of, in very many of the big cities increases competition. And as far as I understand it, the argument when you, when you ask that goes kind of like this, if you take both sides. Well, you know, we own Philly and you have New York, and when we're done putting them together, that's still, that'll be the same because, you know, it's not like we took away two competitors in either of those cities. Um, that's one way to look at it because there's still the satellite guys right. and all that in each of these. Uh, I guess that would lead to a question assuming that's the if that's the uh, most important way to look at it, you'd have to ask, well, why wouldn't it be fine if all the franchises in the entire country all came together and we had one cable company? Because we'd still have Dish and DirecTV and Verizon and AT&T. So you, you gotta follow that train of thought. Uh, the second one is, is that the most important thing, those five competitors? Because two of them, sat the satellites, can't do uh, broadband delivery. So you're down to three mostly broadband delivery devices, the telcos and 
whoever the cable company is. Um, and that's actually the most relevant question about competition. Does it increase competition to have concentration on a national basis in broadband? And if you do that, and the entity that, that is in that position also has vertical interests um, of, in other things, right. including programming that goes through the pipes, which hopefully is going to all be treated. Look, you could call it program neutrality. Right. As, you know, mm -hmm. Instead of net neutrality. Um, is that going to be uh, as robust a competition to drive broadband innovation and broadband uh, capacity? Uh, so I would leave it as a question. Right. You've raised two, you, you don't want to answer those two questions. Well, you just, just leave it as a question because they're clearly uh, I think we know others who have to I think figure we know, this out. We, we know where you might land. Uh, let me ask yeah. you a, a separate question then uh, on net neutrality. Uh, yeah. which is to say in this grand debate, you've heard what the president has said recently uh, on this issue. Where do you stand? Well, I have to ask another question. Because um, we have a couple, we have the question of do we want uh, the broadband distribution system to be something that can be turned into a two-tier or more kind of a thing when we all want innovation in broadband so we don't want the well-heeled to crowd out access to the, to the user, you know, from that point of view. On the other hand, we also want uh, a robust broadband plant with high capacity that evolves to be able to deliver the most advanced products, whether it's games without right. mm -hmm. uh, delay, whether it's um, high definition television. And there's a question with those two because um, how do you get the broadband investment? I mean, right now, if you take video consumption in America over broadband, um, the video being consumed every night now is, is you, it's about 10% of the viewing of television. And it's using up close to half the broadband capacity of the country. So if we're talking about having more and more video going over broadband. You want that investment. Then how is, the plant's gonna have to get much more right. robust, which is gonna require billions in capital investment. So and the question you, is, how do you create the incentives and returns for those that have to make those investments and what's the method of and doing you, it? And you can pay for the, fa you, you at Time Warner can effectively pay for the, for the faster lane. If you're a start, I guess the question is, how do you create the balance so that if I wanted to start the next HBO to go with the next Netflix, yeah that I could afford to effectively go over the same pipes and not sit there and have my viewers buffering all day where you're right. flying well, I, over so 100, that's the 100 miles an hour. So I guess the question I have to ask, I mean, you should answer it, not me, because it's better if you answer. Um, have you seen worrisome instances where broadband providers, ISPs, have done that and created discriminatory access in a way that would stifle innovation and in Netflix, so doing, Netflix would say yes. Netflix. Okay, well, the, the, I don't know. And if that were to happen, do we really think, it's really a question of whether, how much can competition between broadband providers make sure that they don't engage in that kind of behavior, which you all know as viewers and payers of broadband services, you wouldn't tolerate that. So that's one answer, competition. The other is regulation and the extent to which you think that regulation can both protect everybody and foster more investment and innovation, which is where it becomes problematic. Let me go to a, a different topic, which is uh, CNN, in particular TV news. TV news, TV cable news, across the board, ratings have, have been down. Well, uh, so has and, broadcast television news. And it has been, but it has been a steady decline. And the question I have for you is whether you think, as we move forward, there is a marketplace for a network like CNN, and how big a marketplace is that, and what does a network like that have to look like? Can you okay. do straight news, and can that be profitable? Yes, 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 and yes. So there is a growing opportunity, viewership, and financial support for news, electronically delivered. 
when you, you're right, the TV news of you know, programmatic video has been declining. And the reason is the audience is pretty old. The younger people don't watch don't as want, much of NBC watch Nightly News, news right. or Fox or, mm -hmm. HBO or CNN. Um, well, so what are they doing? Well, they're going more to online news, which if you take all of the traditional news providers, including this company, uh, New MSNBC, Times. New York Times, and, and uh, is this the New York Times? Or New York is this Times. This? Okay, we're, we're at the New, New York, York Times. Times. Good job on for you. <laughs> So CNN's news audience, um, if you focus on just the TV stuff and not just CNN, it's been secularly going down and the audience getting older. We do have the youngest audience of the, those news providers. If you look at our broadband delivered news and mobile delivered news, CNN is growing very fast and has a quite a big relative advantage against the other providers. But isn't that that's a much lower margin business? Well, so the, far. But is, is this the same issue that the, that the newspapers are facing, mm -hmm. which is to say that we're, we, you could argue that you're trading, you know, uh, well, yeah, you're do, do dollars yeah. for digital, you know. Uh, you know, it all works out eventually penny. because you have most of the money for news is in subscription support anyway, whether it's Fox or The CNN. carriage fee. Yeah. Yes. Um, but how long does that last? The next time well, the you go on, to you could sell it a la carte. CNN is, is a huge brand all over the world. It's going up, not down. The profits are going up. It had a record year again this year. But the next time you have to go uh, make a, a new carriage deal with DirecTV everybody, or everybody. Comcast or whomever, and they say, look, the, the ratings for you and Fox and MSNBC and CNBC and, are all less than they used to be. If you don't want it, don't carry it. Don't you think that they're going to want to pay you less, not more? Well, they always want to pay us less, not more. But they always pay us more. <laughs> uh, let me ask you uh, two, two other quickies, and then we'll just open it up for a couple questions from the audience. Um, there has been lots of talk about the future of Viacom and CBS and what happens to, that, to those companies. Um, yes, there has. There has. And not just recent and for a long for, for time. For a very, very long yeah. time, um, given that Sumner controls both of those companies. What do you think happens to both of those companies um, five, 10, 20 years from now? Do, I mean, I, I, do you think that they've become a merger partner for a, for a Time Warner? Well, they're, they may want to be a merger partner for somebody, maybe even themselves. Uh, whether they want to be for us is, a, you know, whether, I guess, I don't know if they do or not. Um, well, I know something about it, but I'm not, I don't want to talk about it. But so for <laughs> us, um, look, we have to look at it. When everything comes up in the world, whether it's them or all the other media, we look at it. Uh, the thing we've said about Time Warner had the added value of being true. Uh, we've said it for a long time. Um, and you can see what we've been doing. We, ha we have not been. We've been looking at everything. We don't have right. to do it. Here's why. We have the biggest scale in the businesses we wanted to be in. That's what we spent the last five years getting to this point. The explosion is video. And about, you know, what are we, we've got the biggest premium network group in the world, HBO. We've got the biggest basic cable group in the world, Turner. We love that position between HBO and Turner. Take Turner, which is not as well understood as HBO because it's so many right. different networks. But you know, you got TBS and TNT, huge entertainment networks with earnings that if you put them together are more, I think, than all four broadcast networks put together. So you have that, you have CNN, Cartoon Network, Adult Swim, the biggest rated network of 18 to 34, all of which is, you know, the best global properties there. CNN and Cartoon Network are huge number one networks all over the world, and they're very well placed to go on VOD or on broadband or on a la carte if you had to do it. So the, fur the further thing why when if we look at other companies we're always not so sure it would help us. We've got such scale and concentration with 85 percent of our fees at Turner going right. through our four biggest networks. That's not even counting HBO. Um, if you go to Warner's it's the biggest slate of series right. TV for the world. It's the biggest slate of films. So if you then add somebody 
most of those, while if they're adjacent business, right. could weaken our position. Do we don't need, want marginal networks. If, do, if, you need, do you need sports, more sports? Well, we, we have these have long sports, sports yep. deals. We've and we have got, Adam Silver coming up a little bit later. Yeah, good. Well, you should ask him. We're big partners with Adam. We've got 10 years or, more, you know, or so on NBA, NCAA with the championships and baseball. Do you baseball. think those fees can keep going up the way they have been? Um, yeah. And that's, that, will never, that will never stop? Well, look, I mean, what's, it, you what's, know, the, the, what's the, issue, the top? And, and do they ever get moved to another tier? Yeah, I mean, maybe, do they ever get moved off know. the basic tier? Well, and what does that do to the economics, well, not just of the we, leagues, but of the of, of them? Of them. Yeah, I don't know. Um, for the sports we have, which we're very happy with, basketball and baseball, um, great growing global appeal. We have better ratings for our basketball because we share these with some other networks, ESPN, CBS. Right. They do better on ours. We have, we have good uh, announcers and, and so forth. Uh, so we're really happy with how that's going. It's not, you know, TBS, TNT, True TV, they're not sports networks. Right. So there's so much other great breakthrough programming on there, big broad reach programming, that we think we have a very good mix. Now, you know, if the sports numbers get high enough that the half of the people that don't want to pay those fees for regional sports right. networks and uh, the big national sports rights and foot, then I don't know, but we're not in that position. Okay. Uh, let's open it up uh, for questions, uh, get uh, some opportunities. We have a, a hand over there. There's a, we'll get you a, get you a mic too. Yeah. Hi, how are you doing? Uh, I'm Agustino with uh, Forbes magazine. So we're talking about the distribution of professional, uh, professionally created content, right? That's kind of like the whole, idea. When we're talking about video and HBO, we've seen that the model has kind of moved forward in ter terms of how you monetize it. Can you kind of relate that to what we're seeing when it comes to journalism and, and news where the model isn't working as well? You know, we see companies trying to adapt to the web and we see a lot of those profits maybe going to companies like Google rather than the New York Times. Uh, can you put those two sort of in context and where it goes in 10 years? Well, that's a tough one. Um, on the professional content, you know, entertainment content, that sort of thing, whether it's HBO, Netflix, CBS, you know, whatever it is, uh, people want it on demand. So they want to see things that were created for half hour, hour, two hour kinds of time periods, uh, what, even unscripted ones. Um, and they want to see it on VOD. So that's one change. That doesn't necessarily, you tend to think that requires broadband or over the top delivery. You can do it that way, but it's not the only way. You can, you can watch, and for 10 years, all your HBO shows on demand over your cable streaming, television set-top box, and so forth. So that's just a kind of a uh, regular evolution. On the news side, I think the question is, and I actually, thank you, you remind me of something. Is it the half-hour show, uh, Anthony Bourdain, Le Lucy Liu, all our new CNN originals are our top shows. And you could see people wanting those on demand either through a CNN Everywhere subscription or through some a la carte way of doing it. You could do that. Whether they want to tune in to the 10-minute segment that's part of the daily news coverage uh, yesterday on a plane crash, I don't know. Um, you know, they tend to get those, because of that kind of news, breaking news, tends to be pretty much available through a lot of outlets in the public domain. It doesn't lend itself as much to VOD. What do you make of the phenomenon of Vice? Well, Vice is basically online delivered segments of breaking news or their take on it on a VOD basis, right? So it would, I mean, that's how you get it. It's not on a linear schedule. But they right. seem to manage to make it work in a different way. Yeah, I think that, so that shows that you could do news on right. demand and take right. this, take your thing and put it on demand, see if anybody wants it. Uh, media companies like Time Warner are highly organized around the brands that they own. Um, a lot of people think that brands in the future are gonna be less important to consumers. And I'm wondering if at Time Warner, you guys are planning for a future like that, kind of what your thoughts are, if uh, the world moves in that direction kind of the next five years. Okay, I think I, I'm hearing that, not that brand 
don't work, like Google, Facebook, et cetera, but that you're saying, I think the network brand as a way to go find what you want right. versus the show, exactly. and finding the show either through search or through your friend's social recommendation and so forth. Um, and then recommendation engines for companies that have the data on what you like. All of those things will happen. And uh, what we think is the answer, and that's why we've been investing more in our content budgets every year for the last five years, even while we were doing all these earnings growth, is if you have the key content, think, think back to HBO, because when we started doing originals and HBO in a very serious way in the 90s, where most of our business had depended on identified movies, you know, hit movies. We didn't have enough money for more than a couple of shows, Sopranos, uh, Oz, right. Sex on the City. And we didn't have a schedule to launch them in, so that would say, and the brand didn't mean that at the time. So when we did that and got some shows that were successful, it then created an understanding of what HBO was that made it a place where you still go, you wouldn't argue your, your premise would be last applied to HBO because it's still a place where people go and say, geez, you know, I, I always am interested in some of the things they do. I like, here's their new show, I'm gonna go see it. Uh, so we think there's a way to do it. We're very much in the process of making, uh, and by the way, let's take CNN. CNN has a very powerful brand. We just launched five original shows. Anthony Bourdain, Lucy Liu, um, Mike Walt, the, you know, they're all top shows on CNN. That shows that that brand is an effective place to launch things. And if you keep the, the breakthrough content and you offer it the way people want on VOD and on every device, you have a functioning brand. That's what the brand made. That's what YouTube is to people. They know what to go there to get new, fresh things. I, I don't think there's any reason why you can't have a very powerful brand so long as you make the way it works, relevant to all the audience, and particularly the young people. Jeff, we gotta go, what's your favorite TV show right now? Game of Thrones. Game of Thrones. Uh, this was kind of like Game of Thrones. Uh, appreciate it very, very <laughs> Thank much. You very Thank, much. You. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.